We'll have Pastor come forth and bring us the word this morning. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I give praise to our God in the worthy name of Jesus Christ this morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord with you all. If you are visiting with us this morning, we praise our God for you being here, and we thank you for coming to worship with us and to be able to come now to this portion of the service where we open up God's Word and hear from Him, listen to His Word being preached, and trust that the Word of God would go into our ears and down deep into our hearts and that it would find good, rich soil to sprout and to bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, and even some hundredfold. We go to the book of Acts now, as I've been preaching through the book of Acts, and we've made it all the way to chapter 6, verses 1 through 7 this morning, by way of a title, you see it there on the screen, Growing Pains growing pains. I think it's a fitting title because of what we learn here. And as we've been reading through the book of Acts, I hope that you've seen it. I would encourage you to continue to read the book of Acts even prior to having it being preached Sunday morning. Study it through the week and maybe it'll strike up some good question or conversation in our fellowship afterwards. And you might even be able to help me as I grapple with it and think through. I don't have all the answers, you know. And so it's always good to have eyes and ears and study and minds uh, grappling with the text of God's Word that we might be able to grow by it. Let's read it, and then I'll pray, and then by God's grace preach. Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1. The good Dr. Luke writes, and he says, And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not fitting that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look among you for seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Proctorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Permanus, and Nicholas, a proselyte, of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, as we come before your throne of grace this morning, Help us, Lord, to understand, to know, to believe wholeheartedly that it truly is a throne of grace. Father, help us to avail ourselves to that grace as you have opened that throne up by means and way of your beloved Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we read in the account of the crucifixion and even what happened shortly after is as he died, the veil that separated the holiest to the holiest was torn in two. It was ripped asunder from top to bottom, opening the way, Lord, that sinners might come directly to your presence and plead to you for mercy and grace, opening the way for sinners to come directly to God through the sacrifice of your beloved Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, may we be found in him this morning. Even as we pray, Lord, may we be found to have the blood of the Lamb covering our sins, making atonement for our sins, that we might be able to boldly come to that throne of grace without fear, without trembling, Lord, knowing that 
we have forgiveness from God. We have peace with God. We have been justified by God. We are being sanctified by God. Help us, Lord, to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the work that thou hast performed and done in and through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, has truly made us free in the greatest of ways. That we are free to come to you without fear of condemnation, without fear of being consumed by your wrath because our Lord and Savior drank every drop on Calvary's cross. Help us, Lord, to carry that as we live our lives. Help us, Lord, to have that impact us, that it might make us holy, that it might make us zealous of good works, that it might make us more like your Son, that you would continue to conform us to his image, that we might walk worthy of a vocation to which we've been called. Father, do that for your people. Edify them, encourage them, and strengthen them, Lord, that they might be a testimony of thy grace. Father, I pray for those who may be listening or here this morning that know not Christ as Savior, Lord, and King. We pray, Father, that today might be the day of salvation. We pray, Lord, your grace and your powerful mercy might go to them and cause them to have repentance to the acknowledging of their sins, that they would see themselves as undone before a holy and a righteous God, and that they might be granted faith, that you would bring it, Lord, through the preaching and the teaching of your word, that it would beget faith within the hearts of people, and that it would cause them to see Jesus as their Savior, Lord, and King. Lord, do this for the glory of your own name. Do this for the glory of your beloved Son, Father. We ask that you would do this in exalting yourself, that you would receive glory, that you would receive honor, that you would receive praise, because you are worthy of all of that. So, Father, do these things as only you can. We plead with you for that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We come to this passage of Scripture, <laughs> and a little bit of, it's not really background. If you've been here for any length of time going through the book of Acts, you remember Luke is writing the book of Acts to most excellent Theophilus, and Theophilus, we really don't know who he is, but apparently Luke is giving him this historical account of what has taken place since the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, or we could say even the ascension of Jesus Christ, as we've read about that in Acts chapter 1. But I think what he wants to do is give Theophilus a better account, a, a, a whole account of what the Lord Jesus Christ is continuing to do. Uh, he's not just filling him in on, well, you know, uh, the Lord Jesus was here, as you know, Theophilus, and now he's gone, and here these people are that got that message, and they're, they're just trying as best they can to make all of this go together and work. No, that, that's not it at all. You remember Theophilus, I believe, is writing to the fact, oh, Theophilus, understand that, yes, even though the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and slain, and that he was placed in a tomb, but remember on the third day that that dead body that was on the cross rose from the grave, amen? The tomb was empty. He lives, he lives, he lives. And oh, he was seen for 40 days and nights by the, by the apostles as he makes all of these appearances. We read that in the Gospels, but Luke is giving Theophilus that account. This work that is being done is being done by the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Exactly what he said was going to happen, happened. He ascended into heaven. He seated at the right hand of the Father. And as that took place, he said what was going to happen and what happened. I'm going to send the Spirit. Remember those great passages. The Comforter will come. You're sorrowful now, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. It's expedient for you that I go to the Father. For if I go not to the Father, the Comforter won't come. I'm going to go, and when I go, and when all of this takes place, the Spirit is going to come. He's going to descend upon you, and you are going to be filled with power. 
You're going to be able to complete the work that I began. You're going to be able to continue the work that I'm doing. And that power and that work is going to be accomplished by my spirit placed within you. Amen? If you're a blood-bought child of God, that spirit is in you. Amen? I'm glad you said amen. There's no excuses then, is there? Do, 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 do you lack power? You said, amen. The, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the almighty, powerful Spirit of God, Christian, dwells in you. What do you need that he can't afford to give? What is it that you lack that you think he don't have to give you freely? You see, the power, the grace, the mercy, the love, the magnificence of who you are in Christ Jesus. He promised to send the Spirit. He sent the Spirit. And he said, if you have him, then you have his Spirit. Magnificent. I'm beating myself up. Not just you. Because so oftentimes we walk around as if the Spirit wasn't even present. That may be by means and way of awful gross sin in our lives that we all need to repent of. Or it may simply be just a demeanor of character and illicit thinking about God and who He is and what He's given. Oftentimes we live lives as victims. Oftentimes we live our lives as if we were powerless and there's nothing that we can do and it's, it's all just humdrum, ho-hum. It's so awful. Child of God, you have the Spirit of God in you. I want to live like that, amen? Amen. Luke is telling Theophilus all about that. And this is historical narrative through the book of Acts. Luke is telling us about the growth of the church, the continued work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit. And we've, we've followed that. Just, just so you know, preacher, are you, you're not just assuming that. I'm not just assuming that. That's exactly what this word tells us, Right? You don't have to turn there, but I'm just going to read a few passages. Some of them we've already been there, just to let you know. Luke Is Luke filling us in on growth of the church? Well, of course he is. Look, look what Luke says in chapter 2, verse 41. I'm in chapter 4. Chapter 2, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized in the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Growth, verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Growth, right? You go to chapter 4, over to chapter 4, verse 4. But many of them who heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Growth. You go to chapter 5, verse 14. And believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes, both of men and women. Growth. Chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit were multiplied. Growth. Chapter 13, verse 49. This continues all through the book. Chapter 13, verse 49. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Growth. Chapter 16, verse 5. 
And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Growth. Chapter 19, verse 20. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. 19 verse 20 is Ephesus. That's where Paul is preaching at Ephesus. 16.5 is Galatia. 13.49 is Pisidia. Luke is telling us, letting us in on the work of the Lord Jesus Christ because the Lord Jesus Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. No wonder as we come to the book of the Acts of the Apostles or the Acts of the Holy Spirit or the Acts of the resurrected, ascended, living Lord Jesus Christ, what are you going to see? You're going to see growth of the church. This amazing movement, very early, we're still early, we're still in Jerusalem in the book of Acts up to this point, but it's, it's, it's an amazing movement of the gospel going forth, the church growing in number. But what we see is we see it's not a perfect church yet, is it? Luke lets us in on some of the growing pains. We've already seen... You remember it throughout the book of Acts, Luke kind of focuses on the inside and then he focuses on the outside. Luke focuses on the church and what's going on inside of it and then he focuses on the evangelism and the testifying and the preaching and the going forth of the gospel outside of the church. But he's let us in already, you remember, as we, as we looked in Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5, we saw glorious things going on within the church, but then we also saw some ugly things going on, right? The terrible sin of Ananias and Sapphira. We dare not forget it. Lying to the Holy Spirit, trying to appear to be more than what they actually were. Sold a piece of land, whatever they sold it for, didn't matter. They could have took all of the money and said, we sold a piece of land and now we're going over here and building another house or doing whatever they want. It was their money. They could do whatever they want to do with it. The problem is, is they took a portion of that money, laid it before the apostles' feet, and they said, we gave every penny we had. Look at how holy and good we are to the church. Of course, that wasn't the truth, was it? They faked it. They lied. And the judgment of God fell. So Luke lets us in on some of the things that the church is going to be threatened by. He lets us in as we see the church go through these growing pains. And through all of this growth, Luke tells us exactly how this growth is happening. How, how's the growth happening, Luke? And we, we see that at the end of chapter 5, verse 42, don't we? And, and daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. You want to see the church grow? Preach and teach Jesus. <laughs> I, love, I love the simplicity of that, don't you? If you want to see the church grow, the way the church grows is sinners get saved. The way sinners get saved is you have to tell them about Jesus Christ. Is that right? That's right. You want to see the church grow? Go witness to people. Go tell people about Jesus. Go tell them all that you can, all that you know about Jesus. Go share your testimony. Go tell people how Jesus came from heaven, born of a virgin. Go tell people how Jesus lived a perfect holy life for 33 years. Go tell people how Jesus, even in that sinless life, ended up bleeding and dying, suffering a painful death on the cross of Calvary, not for any sin that he committed, but for the sins of his people, that whosoever should believe believe on him would not perish but have everlasting life sinners that go tell them how exalted and magnificent and glorious he is even in that sacrifice because God received the sacrifice and raised him from the dead on the third day you can be sure that your sins are forgiven why because Christ rose from the dead go tell sinners that 
Go tell sinners that he ascended into heaven and he's at the right hand of the Father now, ruling and reigning with all things under his power. Yeah, it looks like a mess out there, but you can be sure that there is a sovereign Lord and he is in control of every single aspect of everything. Go tell sinners that. Go do what they were doing here. Go preach and teach Jesus. Because when the church does that, people get saved and the church grows. I love how God didn't make it rocket science. Because I would be, I am not a very smart guy. But the simplicity of the gospel that even a, even a three-year-old child can somehow understand. When the Spirit of God opens a heart and a mind to the truth of His Word and the glory of His grace in sending His Son, it is filled with amazing power to save, is it not? Isn't that what happened to you, child of God? Didn't someone come to you and tell you that you're in trouble with God because you've sinned against Him. But oh, glory be to the grace and the mercy of God in sending His beloved Son to save you from your sin. And if you in simple faith believe on Him, thou shalt have peace with God. Amen? Luke tells us how it happened. And he tells us about various threats to the church and obstacles to growth that were overcome here in Acts chapter 6. That's what this passage is all about. I'd ask you if you would notice uh, it, it begins and ends with a reference to growth. Notice what it says, chapter 6, verse 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples was what? Increased, multiplied, growth. It starts with growth, doesn't it? Notice what it says in, in verse 7. And the word of God, what? Increased, multiplied. And the number of the disciples, what? Multiplied, it increased. Sandwiched in between is an obstacle or a threat to that. So Luke fills us in how salvation and this growth took place, how all of this magnificent uh, building of the church by the power of the Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ. He tells us how it happened through preaching and teaching Jesus, but he also shares with us that there are things that will threaten that growth. <clears throat> Sandwiched in between verse 1 of chapter 6 and verse 7 of chapter 6, sandwiched in between those two statements is a threat. It is a threat to the movement. It is a threat to the gospel and the work that has been going on thus far all throughout the book of Acts and what you're going to see through the rest of the book of Acts. So it's a threat, and it has to be overcome. And what we see here in Acts chapter 6 is what they did to overcome the threat. But for now, let's just take a look at the threat, which I believe is twofold. There's a threat here, and it, it deals with two, two, two issues that are dangerous. Number one, we learn that there is a conflict between the Hellenists, which for time's sake, it, let's just say the Hellenists or the Grecians are Greek-speaking Jews. They are Jews that are Greek-speaking. And apparently there seems to be a rift between the... Hebrew, Aramaic-speaking, or Hebrew-speaking Jews, and the Greek-speaking Jews. So much so that this conflict arises, uh, we read right in verse 1. As they're multiplying, all of this great stuff is happening. There arises, or there arose, verse 1b, a murmuring of the Hellenists, or the Grecians, against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So apparently there was a failure on the church's part to take care of the widows on the Hellenist side, the Greek-speaking Jew side. So apparently there are some cultural 
or ethnic tensions in the early church at Jerusalem. It may be that already in Jerusalem there were two movements separated along with language concerns. And I, and I believe you can trace this even through the Bible, that, that there was that. Greek-speaking Jews compared to Hebrew-speaking Jews were like this. We don't have time to go into that, but you remember even John chapter 4, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. There's issues there that, so why are you talking to me? I think that because of places like that in Scripture, but also even in the context of Acts chapter 6, look at verse 9. I believe that there were already, uh, in Jerusalem, there were two separate movements between the Hellenistic Jews and the, the Hebrews. I believe that there were probably separations in the synagogue at the time. I get that from Acts 6, 9. Look at what it says. Then there arose of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, or Libertines, and Cyrenius and Alexandrius, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. So apparently, there's a, a group, a sect within the synagogue that separated themselves from other people. So it appears that there is this cultural, ethnic display of division, separation, where this is my party, that's your party, and never the twain shall meet. And I think what's going on here in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, there are the Hebrews, and there are the Grecians, and the Grecians, the widows on the Grecian side, are getting taken care of in the daily ministration. One of the results of that cultural, ethnic division was that the system developed in Acts chapter 4 to take care of the poor was not working for the minority group in the church. Remember Acts chapter 4, 34, what was, what was going on? You remember how we, we, we were there? Acts chapter 4, 34, all the churches gathered together, there's this great fellowship, there's this great love, there's this great transition, transformation, so much so that those who were wealthier were going out and selling what they had, bringing the money back, and they were laying it before the apostles' feet, and the apostles would take that, and they would distribute to each one as they had need. Now, all of a sudden, Acts chapter 6 rolls around, we got all these people, 8,000, 10,000, a lot of people that just got saved. The church is growing, and now here are these widows that aren't being taken care of because of some kind of division, and it's within the church. Where's the love now? Where's what's going on? How come, how come our widows aren't being taken care of? The one of the most dangerous things we can ever come to in the body of Christ is when we fail to recognize each other as equally important within the body. This isn't a heretical problem. This isn't a problem with a certain group of people teaching, well, there was no resurrection. There's not a, not a problem with teaching that Jesus didn't really die. This isn't, this isn't a heretical problem. This is a murmuring problem. It happens, bang, so fast, so quick, doesn't it? There arose a murmuring. Rick, pull that, pull that passage back up from 1 Peter chapter 4, would you? Consider this, beloved. Consider this. This is how it starts. This is a threat to the whole movement of Christianity early on in this early church age. And guess what? It's still just as much a threat today. Look at what Peter says. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Above all things, above all things, above all things, do what? Have a fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. It don't take long, beloved. It don't take long to walk into a church. Someone ticks someone off. Listen, I'm a prickly person. I'm going to say, you hang around me long enough, you're going to get upset with me. 
I'm going to sin against you. I, I hate that about myself, but the reality of it is true. And if we don't live like this, if we allow this to continue in the church, where there's murmur, oh, so you believe brother so-and-so, do you believe sister so I, oh, let me, let me go tell brother so-and-so about this. Uh, do you believe what so-and-so did over there and it talk like that? No, that, that, you, you can't, we can't have it. Why? It'll rip the whole movement apart. Be careful. Be careful because if you backbite one another, if you murmur and grumble and complain against one another, you'll be consumed by one another. How detrimental is this to the gospel to have these people, if this murmuring continued, if this complaining continued, if this continued to go on, and now these people go out of the church and say, yeah, they love, but, but they don't love the Hellenistic Jews. We speak different than them, and therefore they don't help us out when we have needs. You see the mark it would have put on the testimony of the gospel that brings all people groups together and makes them one? If this continues on in a church, no, it don't. No, it doesn't. They say it works, but it don't work. See what happens when we grumble, when we moan, when we complain, especially about one another? If that were to continue, then Christians would come in to disrepute. The glory of Christ would be dimmed in the eyes of the world. The whole movement would have experienced a significant setback. It isn't any less true today. I spoke to a guy last week. He's not a Christian man. But he's a really cool guy. <laughs> and he was talking to me. He's a friend of mine. He was talking to me. So I heard about the preacher over here, and I heard about the preacher over there, and I heard about people over there, and I've heard about this going on over there in this church. I heard about that going on. I don't know. I don't know where he heard these things. But he says, and I know you. And he says, I haven't heard anything bad about you yet. <laughs> so I said, well, why don't you come over and worship with us? Why don't you come over in, in the service? I said, there's lots of things wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with God. But it says something. Some of those things he heard may be true or not, but he heard them from someone. Who did he hear it from? Someone who didn't go to someone they had a problem with, but they rather left or walked out of the church and murmured and complained. There's one soul that got burned by it. How many more? That's one threat. And it's a real threat. Luke, Luke doesn't sugarcoat it. This is the truth. It's a serious issue. There arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. They really were being neglected. There's something wrong here. The problem is that a certain group of people weren't being taken care of. They are bringing all the money, they were bringing all these things, and all this, and as it was distributed among them, somehow these Hellenistic Jews, these Greek-speaking Jews, the widows there, weren't getting taken care of. It's not compassionate, not compassionate towards one another, backbiting, murmuring, complaining, not doing what is right, not considering each other. How dangerous a threat that is to the local church. I'll go a little further and press this more. If you have a problem with someone, just, just do what Jesus tells you to do. Go to that person. For Christ's sake, go to that person and talk to them. They're your brother in the Lord. If they hear you, if they listen to you, then you've won your brother. 
If they don't, for crying out loud, take two or three others with you. That everything may be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Could get ugly, I get it. We're prickly people. Sometimes we could be dealing with someone who may not be a brother or sister in the Lord. But we take certain steps. We don't walk out the doors and go, oh, I blah, 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 blah. Don't do that. What's the next step if they don't hear you? No reconciliation, no forgiveness. There's still this tension. Well, then go out and murmur and complain. No. No. Bring it before the church. Bring it before the body. Let them establish it. Let them work it out. Let them help you in all of that. And then it becomes something that the church is a judicial stature on the face of this planet. Praise God. Praise God. They won't hear the church. Treat them like a tax collector or infidel. We listen to the church of the living God, don't we? God has established his body, and each and every one of you carry wisdom and mercy and grace, and knowledge and love, compassion, a desire to see reconciliation and Christ exalted and God honored. Amen? We don't just turn our backs or talk bad about each other. You got a problem with me? Come see me. If, if, I, don't, if I don't set it straight or I'm obtuse or cantankerous, by all means, please bring two or three others with you. And if it gets that bad where I'm still not shaping up or wising up and I'm in the wrong, please, by all means, tell the church. We all should have that heart open. I want to be right with God. And the way to be right with God is to be right with His people. Threat number one. Murmuring and complaining because it's a reality. They weren't being taken care of. Failure on the church's part to see a great need which turns into a huge threat. Threat number two. I think the second part of the threat that I see in the context of Acts chapter 6 is what would happen if the first threat were solved in the wrong way? What would happen if that threat of, listen, there's a group of people over here aren't being taken care of? What would happen if the apostles at the time just said, listen, guys, we better get on this. Nobody else is going to do it. It's just us. Let's just let's we, we let's put the word aside for a while and go wait on these Hellenistic widows and get the job done. That's a threat. It appears that way even in the text. Notice what it says, verse two. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, "It is not fitting that we should leave the word of God." and serve tables. That sounds like a defense, doesn't it? It sounds like someone must have come to the apostles with the suggestion that the apostles give more. Listen, guys, you need to give more hands-on time to these widows over here. I know you're always studying, and I know you're always praying, but you need to put that aside for now and take care of this problem over here. That could have been a very dangerous The second part of the threat was that those called to the ministry of the word would leave that word in prayer and serve tables. Luke gives us a clear indication that the temptation to do this is a major, major threat to the whole movement. We read that. Verse 2, the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and they, they said... It, it, it's not fitting. This, this would be dangerous. It's not, it's not good. It's not incumbent that we should stop studying the Word, stop preaching and teaching the Word, stop proclaiming the Word, stop witnessing and praying and go and serve tables. It, would, it wouldn't be fitting for us to do that. Uh, 
I think Luke, as he gives that clear indication to the temptation to do that as a major threat to the movement, is I think he, he forges it together with verse 2, notice, it, it is not fitting that we should leave the word of God to serve tables. And then in verse 7, look what happens. And the word of God increased. If they would have just laid down, not kept teaching the word of God, preaching the word of God, studying the word of God, then verse 7 wouldn't have been able to be there. The word of God would not have increased. In other words, his point is the word of God kept spreading and bearing fruit because they didn't make the strategic mistake of leaving their focus from the word of God and prayer to go fix a very pressing problem. So the, th the second threat is to the ministry of the word. This is interesting because as you read Acts chapter 6 verses 1 through 7, it is something good that is the threat, not something bad. In other words, it would not have been a good thing, or it would have been a good thing in and of itself for the apostles to, to do. There, 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 there is, it, wouldn't it be a good thing to say, hey, there's the apostles over there, and they're distributing themselves to these widows. That's not a bad thing. It's a, it's a good thing. But it would have been a bad thing for them to leave their calling of preaching and teaching and studying and praying the Word of God to go do this thing. It's interesting. As a pastor, this hopefully makes me wiser. Because I have a problem. And you need to pray for me. If I were there, I probably would have screwed it all up. Guys, I'll get it done. I'll take care of it. No. You, you, you can't leave this. And it's not that there isn't anybody else who can't do it. I don't know what it is about me, but, but sometimes my skills in delegation and being a guy, maybe it's from the construction world, maybe it's just my mindset. I don't know what it is. I, I, I'm not doing this out of a heart, I believe, of, of sin and look at me. I just, I'm just the guy who kind of likes to do things, get things done, and hope make people happy doing them. But it can be very, very dangerous. There'll be times where pastors, deacons, leaders in the church sweep down in and took care of it all, but you just stopped over the ten people who could have been serving the Lord in the church. Think more like that. It wouldn't have been bad. It would have been a good thing in and of itself for the apostles to do, but it would have been a fatal mistake for the whole movement, for the whole process, for the whole order that had already been set up. It could be a very dangerous thing as leaders, pastors, hear the apostles. It could be a very dangerous thing. It could, it's not could be, it is. It is a very dangerous thing for any pastor to think that they're somehow the, the superior, that they're somehow the one who has to do all the work, that they're somehow a, a uh, uh, super Christian. And if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. Mm. Danger, danger, danger. In this context, the danger is, listen, I understand this is a very important need, but it's a need that, that should not call us away from the ministry and the teaching and preaching aspect of the word and prayer, and so how are we going to solve it? How are we gonna do it? And this is amazing, how, number, point number three, how do they overcome the double threat? Well, listen, I, they're always complaining. 
you know, give it a little time, it'll calm down, throw them a little more food, sweep it under, they don't do that, do they? Hopefully it'll go away. <laughs> they don't do that. This is a serious issue. So they don't play it off between each other, they don't sweep it under the carpet, but what do they do? Extremely wise. They delegate. They delegate. They don't look at themselves as the be-all and end-all of it all. If we don't do it, no one else will. No, they look at the body of Christ and they see the diversity of gifts they see the majesty of God and calling his people in all kinds of diverse ways. They look out and they see that there are people within the church who hold great capacities for serving the body of Christ. And it brings glory to God, doesn't it? They delegate it to others and the apostles keep on devoting themselves to the ministry of the word and prayer. Notice what they say. Verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look among you for seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Praise the Lord. Well, we don't know what we're going to do. Go figure it out. No. I'll tell you what you should do. The, the whole body of disciples, look from among yourselves. Look and see. Find men who are filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with faith, honest, walking well with the Lord. Get, get men who are really going to get the job done because it's important. And so what do they do? That's Stephen. There's something about that. He is filled with the Holy Spirit. He is a man of faith integrity. He'd be the guy. It's interesting. All the names are Grecian, Greek names. It seems as though the Hellenistic widows had a whole bunch of men within their group that had a whole bunch of Holy Spirit. Oftentimes the people that murmur the most have more than most. <laughs> Go find seven men filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, Philip, and Prochorus, and Neacor, nor, and Timon, Permenus, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. I'm going to punch each one of the men here in the gut. Can you be a man that is described like that? Can you be a man described as a man who is full of faith? Can you be a man who is described or at least chosen from among the members of the body of Christ? Can you be a man who is full, full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit? Would the church look around on any man in here and say, there's a man who is full of faith. He's full of the Holy Spirit. If not, why not? If not, why not? That's who I want to be. I want to be a man who is full of faith. I want to be a man who is filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to be a man that the body of Christ would look to and say, no, there's a man who walks with God, who loves God, who knows God. He's filled with God. Are you that man? If not, why not? You know Jesus? Do you know, do you know Christ? Do you love him? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? Is he your King? Did he die for you and shed his blood for you? Then you need to be a man who is full of faith and full of the Spirit. Don't write this off as it's something that we can't have or, or we can't get. 
If he's yours, then this is who you ought to be. This is the seed plot of the deaconship. To where we get in seed form deacons, servants of the church. Where's my de deacons? Where's your deacons? Stephen and Jason. Men filled with faith, filled with the Holy Spirit. to undertake serving the body of Christ. We have two. We need ten. Where are you guys? Where are you? Convicting. I'd say the same thing to myself as a pastor. We need to be, we must be men full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. It's not just the pastor and the deacon. The saying, please, the whole multitude, the whole church involved in the process. They delegate, choose seven men. And the whole saying, please, and they choose the seven men, and here they are, and there's a solution to a problem, isn't there? And it's as if Luke wants us to celebrate that. Luke celebrates it. The saying pleased the whole multitude. They chose these men. I'm not going to say their names again because it's hard. <laughs> Nicholas, Stephen, I got. But here these men are now. now yeah, this, is a, this, is, this is good work. The apostles look out at the congregation. They tell that congregation, listen, there's people among you with the diverse amounts of gifts. They're go they'll work. They they'll, they'll serve. They'll, they'll love. They'll, they'll be like Christ. The widows were cared for. The ministry of the word was not forsaken. And the church continues to grow and keep a pure testimony. More and more people, the church is growing. Verse 7, and the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. That's exactly how a church should work, shouldn't it? No, it should be the pastor and the deacons that get everything done. They're, they're the contractors. We hired them. They should be doing the work. No. No. This is, this, is a, this is a structure that's introduced very early here in the book of Acts that gets spelled out more and more throughout the Bible, but the ultimate result is the whole congregation. Look, look from among yourselves. Look from within the church. There are people here that, that are ready, willing, and able to serve. Amen? Phew. something this, this is a, a teamwork as I thought of that word I think a better word is body work but when I say body work I'm a car guy you know what I mean I can understand body work in that context the church is a team collected from members within and not just pastors not just deacons not just the apostles the whole group of us where we do body work. The church, she, she has a dented up fender. But there's one of you here that are a good metal work and you could take a, an awl and a hammer and you can, you can tap those dents out. You've got a rusted quarter panel and there's some of you who can cut that out and put a new patch in there. 
Then there's someone else who does some good putty work and they take Bondo and they mix it up and they put it over there. They sand it out and some of you could be a painter and before you know it, the glory of that and the gifts of the Lord Jesus Christ and providing who he provides in the church, before you know it, you got a really, really beautiful looking restored hot rod. Where are you today? Where are you in that body work? Where are you? Some, some people are just itching to get out of ministry rather than itching to get in. Some people make excuse not to do something rather than try to cancel everything out in order to do that. How willing are you to serve? Maybe you haven't thought about it. But there, listen, there are real problems here. <laughs> Not one of us is perfect. We all need help. Cindy will take all she could get for the nursery. All she could get. Prayer meetings, Bible studies. Some of you have gifts that I'd love for you to exercise. If you want to, come and see me or Pastor Joe or Pastor Evan or one of the deacons or anyone in the church say, hey, I'd like to teach a Bible study. Want to get together with me? We'll look at what you're going to teach and study. Make sure it's good doctrine because we're concerned about the Word of God here. Amen? Amen? If you need help, you might feel a little green. We can help you. We'll disciple you. Come on, money. You want to teach a Bible study? Come on, let's go. I want to teach you how to teach a Bible study. I want you to teach me about the Bible. Because I don't know everything yet. Not that I ever will know everything. It'll learn in eternity. But where are you in the body work? Where are you in the shaping and forming? Where are you as the congregation looks amongst its members to say, there's one full of faith, filled with the Spirit, who will serve in such a capacity that it's going to multiply the church? Amen? Is that what you want? I hope that's what you want. That's who I want to be. That's what I want. That's what I want for you to be. That one day when we're up in heaven and we're gathered around that throne and we don't have any more sin, we won't have to live by faith anymore. We'll live by sight then. We will see him. And we will be able to say, it was worth every bit. It was worth every bit. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for establishing what you've established. Thank you, Lord, for providing here what you've already provided. Thank you for faithful faithful people to the body of Christ. I think of those even serving right now in junior church. I think of those serving even right now in nursery, in their labor of love, and that they've devoted and committed themselves to that for the glory of your name. Thank you, Lord, for faithful deacons and trustees. Thank you, Father, for even those who come and clean the church voluntarily. Thank you, Lord, for those who are concerned about the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for those who are willing to step up even when a need that is very great comes into existence, comes into play, that there are those who are willing to come and serve and to love your people. Lord, we have that here. We pray that you would continue to add to it so that your word can go forth, so that Christ can be exalted, so that you can have the preeminence in everything. We bless you and thank you and praise you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Have the gentleman come for the offering. I say this more often than I have, but the offering here, as you feel led by God to give, I would encourage you to be a cheerful giver. We're not 
We're not a church who is, just keeps pounding and asking money, but there's a reason why I say